G'day and welcome. And what you're looking at at the moment is the 21st integral in Jim Coronis' list of 100 integrals. And it's a rather curious one with a mixture of an inverse trigonometric function and a radical and a difference between squares. And believe it or not, I recorded a solution to this or an evaluation of it and edited and uploaded it to YouTube. But before I made it public, I had second thoughts. The reason being, I produced a very adequate solution in terms of high school usage here in Australia, but I had neglected to talk about analysing it more rigorously, that is looking at the domain in which the integral is relevant. And I had left that as an exercise for you, but on second thoughts, I thought it would be good to actually use this video as an opportunity to discuss domains. So let's have a look at this and we'll talk about, first of all, about what substitutions might be relevant and what domains are relevant. Notice, first of all, the instant we see a radical anywhere in an equation, we have very likely a limitation on what we can substitute simply because in the real number system we can't take the square root of negative numbers. So we know that 1 minus x squared must be greater than or equal to 0, purely because of this radical. Now, we can't even accept 0. Can you see why? Because the square root of 0 would be 0, and we can't divide by 0. So this is our domain restriction because of this part of the function. And if I add x squared to both sides and reverse the equation or the inequality and take square roots, remember that the square root of x squared is the absolute value of x, then x must lie between minus 1 and 1. Now, interestingly, if I look at the inverse cosine, uh, it also has a restriction on its domain. Now, before I do that, let me talk about the notation. I know that in the United States you would use this term, the arc cosine of x. And let me say, as a foreigner, it's actually a very sensible notation. Uh, with this notation that we use, there is some confusion where this can look like an index or a power. Uh, we use it, for example, with other functions. For example, you can have gamma functions, and there's an interesting discussion on the internet about inverse gamma functions. Uh, and it's often, this, this notation is often used for inverse functions. So we do have some confusion, and this notation in the United States is an attempt to overcome it. Uh, so just bear with me, this is the notation we use here in Australia. And if we graphed the inverse cosine function, so for example, if we, let's call it u, equals the inverse cosine of x, that seems quite reasonable. In fact, we're going to use that as our substitution later. That means that x is going to be the cosine of u. And it turns out that our curve well, I will mark it like so. There's 1 and negative 1 and 0. Uh, our curve will do this. And zigzag, or oscillate, forever. And obviously it's not a function. Now, in order to define it as a function, we accept only that part of it, which is which allows us to pass the vertical line test, where there's only one value for every x value. And consequently, uh, we can see that the domain for this is still between minus 1 and 1. Actually, negative 1 and 1 are accepted values here, but not accepted, obviously, inside the radical. But here, certainly, 
pretty much the same domain. Notice that the value of u goes from 0 to pi. We'll come back and talk about that. I'll leave that here, but I am going to remove that. We're going to talk a bit more about this as time goes on. Let's just leave the summary down here. At this point, x lies between negative 1 and 1. And those values are quite relevant both within the radical and within the uh, inverse cosine. So that is the domain for the function that we integrate. Now, let's go ahead and integrate, first of all, by making a substitution. This here invites us to make a trigonometric substitution. That is, to use one of the uh, Pythagorean identities. And this certainly invites us to substitute a u for the inverse cosine of x. So we'll let u equal the inverse cosine of x, which means that cos of u, sorry, is x, or if you like, x is cos of u. And we can work out what dx is, because dx du is going to be, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So dx is negative sine u du. And that will make a good substitution. And if we're substituting x equals cos u, you can see that's a, that uh, is quite a satisfactory substitution in here because we're going to get 1 minus cos squared u which is using that identity sine squared u plus cos squared u is 1. So let's have a look. The inverse cosine of x we replace with a u. The dx we replace with this negative sine u times du. In the denominator we have 1 minus x squared is going to be cos squared u. I'm going to move this negative sign out the front and we have u sine u du and here we have the square root of 1 minus cos squared u is sine squared u and Here's the bit that I wanted to talk about. When you take the square root of a square, or the square of a function, this means the positive root. Now if the function happens to have a negative value, then the positive root will be the opposite of that negative value, or minus. The way we overcome that I've rubbed it off now, is that we take the absolute value of sine u as the square root of a square. And we would have to enter into some discussion here. Now, this is where it's important that we think carefully about what the domain is. And as I said in my previous video, I was going to leave that as an exercise for you. I thought it was a good discussion to enter into. In this domain for x, which is what we have with the original function, when we make this substitution, when u is the inverse cosine of x, you can see that the domain for u is between 0 and pi. Because this is the substitution that we made. And in this domain for u, what is sine u? Well, if we graph sine u, here's where I wish I had a much bigger board. But if I have u and sine u, and I go from 0 to pi, pi on 2, that was very awful there, let me do that again. 
we know that the sine function goes like that. In other words, it's always positive. So taking the absolute value of it makes no difference. It's always going to be positive anyway in that domain. And there, there, therein lies a simplification here. We don't have to take account of whether sine u is negative or sine u is positive. By noting the domain, we know it's going to be positive, and therefore we can simply divide it out and not worry about the sine. So, the integral of u to u, which is u squared on 2 plus c, and then we substitute back for u, which was the inverse cosine of x, and that would be minus inverse cosine of x squared on 2 plus c. And there's a the solution. A little bit unusual, isn't it, having a square of an inverse trig function? But I think you can see that the general flow of this is quite straightforward. The substitution is quite a beautiful one. And having this happen is quite nice. Uh, but a lot of students would blithely do that, ignorant of the need to seriously consider what's happening in the domain. And you can see that by analysing the domain here, and then looking what happens with our substitution, that we can look more carefully at what's happened with this root of the square, and know that we're quite safe in just leaving the positive value. Well, I hope that has helped. I think it's a good discussion to have. Quite a beautiful, unusual little integral. And uh, as always, I thank you for watching.